Hello, today I'll be giving a presentation on the Lunar Zebra, which aims to be the world's smallest and lightest rover yet, and would likely be the first Dutch and European rover on the moon. It's built entirely by students from TU Delft and our partner universities with the help of our wide network of industry partners. I'm Jillian Odebert and I'm a former chief engineer of Lunar Zebro and currently I'm a master student at the Aerospace Engineering Faculty and I'm originally from Aruba. So today I'll be telling you a bit more on what a Zebro actually is and why we want to use them in the first place. Then I'll tell you about our first mission to the moon and what we want to do there. Then I'll go over some design highlights and tell you about the tests that we've conducted on Earth so far, which are in preparation for our mission to the moon. So, Lunar Zebro is actually a part of a much larger Zebro group, which is a project at TU Delft that has been operating since 2010. Zebro stands for Zes Beinige Robot in Dutch, which means six-legged rover, and that refers to the six C-shaped legs that are usually on our robots. And that's actually a technology that was brought over from the United States, where it was developed in the REX project, and that happened back in 2010. And since then, at TU Delft, we've been working on rovers of all sizes, ranging from Pico Zebros, which are about the size of a matchbox, all the way to Kilo Zebros, which are about a meter long and kind of scary. Um, but since 2017, we've been working on the Lunar Zebro, which is the first space-grade version of our robot. Um, and it has about the footprint of an A4 sheet of paper. And since then, we've also worked on terrestrial zebros to support our moon rover development. And those are also approximately the same size. So why do we want to build these small rovers? Well, we're used to seeing the model of having one big rover go on interplanetary missions. So here it's a Mars rover that happens to be on the moon, but that kind of represents what we're used to seeing. Um, in this way, there's one big rover that they spend a lot of time developing because it has to be able to do everything you want it to do. So it's also fully equipped with a whole range of instruments. And this makes it that it's very timely and costly to develop, but also send to its destination. And then once it's there, it's all alone and it has to survive. Um, so you don't want to take too many risks with it and it ends up moving very slowly and stopping as soon as something goes wrong. So instead of this, there are some applications that can benefit greatly from using a swarm of smaller and simpler rovers instead. Um, each of these individual rovers can be simple and easy to manufacture, allowing us to build a greater number at a cheaper cost. And in this way, they can also be used in groups of, say, 50 or 100 rovers. And then you can also take more risks, because if you were to lose one or two along the way, it won't mean that your mission will be over completely. So there are a range of applications that are great for using this swarming technique such as, say, exploring or mapping an undiscovered area. You can also equip our zebros with um, a specific sensor. Say you're looking for water on the moon and want to figure out where the best place to drill is. You can send out a whole um, group of zebros to canvas a larger area in a shorter amount of time. And besides this, we can also think of applications for on Earth. Um, you can use them in search and rescue missions, for example, in buildings that are too dangerous to send humans into. But you could also um, equip them with sensors to detect, for example, toxins in a natural area or maybe illegal substances at an airport. So there are plenty of applications both in space but also here on Earth. So, like I said, the Zebro is a platform that you can equip with some kind of sensor, usually not too many to keep them simple. But before we actually can send a swarm of these zebros to the moon, we need to make sure that the platform itself works and can survive on the moon. So that's why we want to send on our first mission just one zebro. Um, and we have some goals for how we would test that um, platform on the moon for this first mission. So the first one is to mainly survive. We want to have our mission for one moon day, which is the equivalent of 14 Earth days. So that's how long you would be in sunlight for continuously. Um, and that's plenty of time to test out this first zebra and how it's doing. 
So there's plenty of challenges already with this. We need to survive um, extreme temperature ranges, also on the journey from the Earth to the Moon itself. On top of this, there's also radiation, much heavier than we're used to here on Earth. Then there's the lunar dust to deal with. It's very fine and highly abrasive, and it's also electrostatically charged, so it will get stuck to our rover as well. Then, of course, you have to deal with the vacuum and low gravity conditions for the moon. And if that's not all enough, we're also being bombarded by micrometeoroids at very high speeds. So plenty to deal with on a first mission. Um, but we do this mainly because we want to demonstrate our technology and demonstrate that it can survive and function the way we intend it to, especially the unique locomotion with the C-shaped legs, which has never been done before on the moon, but also simply the platform itself. Most of our electronics we develop on our own, and it's not only our technology, but also that of our partners. So we get certain things from our partners, like sensors or materials, and then they help us out by supplying us with them, but then we can also provide validation for them on the moon. Um, so like I said, Lunar Zebra is a platform to do certain things, and we had some space left over on this first Zebra that's going to the moon, so we've equipped it with a scientific payload to measure radiation. Um, so we'll also be getting some scientific benefit from this first moon mission. And lastly, we need to know that all of these things happened, so we need to communicate with Earth. And we do this by sending commands to the rover so it knows what it actually has to do and then getting data back from it to know how it's doing, if it's done its job, and then getting the results back from our scientific measurements and if we're lucky, maybe some pictures. So now I have a video kind of outlining what this mission will look like. First, it will deploy from the lander. This can look a few different ways. It depends on which lander we'll be using. But here it's deployed by a mechanism and then it'll be on its way. Its first most important task is to walk away from the lander and into the sunlight so that it can deploy its solar panel and begin to charge its batteries after its long journey. Then it can also take the time to communicate with the Earth and let it know how it's doing. And once the batteries are charged, it can go on its way performing its mission. So that will look like cycles of walking around and avoiding obstacles while it's doing that. It does that with its navigation system. There are some obstacles that the rover can climb over, but there are also some that are too big for the rover to be able to traverse. So we have a navigation algorithm on board that can detect when an obstacle is too big, and then it waits for a command on how to deal with this, usually to turn and avoid the obstacle. So that way, it goes around avoiding obstacles, and when it has the time, it um, takes the time to charge and also takes scientific measurements, and it kind of repeats this cycle for about 14 days. So now going a bit deeper into some of the design highlights of the rover, um, starting with the two cameras that I just mentioned that are used for our navigation. So by having two of these cameras, we use what is called stereo vision and can see depth, and that's the main way we can detect the obstacles. Um, but we can also use the cameras to take pictures as well. Then we have the rover body. It's an aluminum chassis, like I mentioned, about the size of an A4 sheet of paper, and its main job is to house all the electronics that are the inner workings of the rover. Then we have the iconic C-shaped legs. Um, this is what really makes our rover stand out, and it comes with a bunch of benefits. First of all, we can save mass, because if you would need a wheel to replace these legs, then you would think about a wheel about twice in height of the legs themselves. So by having much smaller legs that can achieve a similar locomotion, um, we're able to save in weight significantly. But the legs also offer the benefit of being able to be programmed in certain ways. So we call them walking gates. Um, and you can think of not only walking forward and backwards, but we're also able to program it to turn in place or do some more crazy things like crawl or even jump if we wanted it to. And lastly, like we saw in the video, the legs are quite robust in traversing rough terrain and able to walk over obstacles that are about the size of the rover itself. Um, so moving on, we 
also have a solar panel as you saw in the video and that's how we charge our batteries in cycles and the solar panel is deployable from 0 to 90 degrees. This has to do with flexibility in choosing where we land on the moon and at what angle the sun rays are coming in at and then we can get the most optimal angle to charge as quick as possible. For us, that would likely be around the south pole of the moon, so we would use a 90 degree angle usually. Then we also have our antenna, which is attached to the solar panel with a mechanism that allows for the antenna to stay at 90 degrees, irrespective of the angle of the solar panel itself. And in a nutshell, that is our small rover. So moving on to some of the tests that we've done on Earth so far. Um, building a space grade rover takes time and you often need to go through multiple um, models to get it up to spec because yeah, space grade materials are quite expensive and you want to make sure you get it right. So we use different models for that. But at the same time, we still want to be able to test out different things with um, terrestrial rovers that are made quicker and cheaper. So we usually do this on what we call analog missions. If there's an astronaut, an analog astronaut involved, those are missions that simulate space missions here on Earth. And sometimes we refer to them as field campaigns. So in the past few years, we've gone on a few of these testing activities. In 2020, a big highlight would be the MS-3 mission to Hawaii, where one of our Zebros worked collaboratively with other rovers, a bigger one and a smaller one. And we also were able to control our rover from Delft all the way in Hawaii through an internet connection. So that helps our team practicing with what the ground station operations would be like in the event of the real mission. Then in 2021, we had two big ones. We had chill ice in Iceland. Um, there we had another analog mission with an astronaut and we were mainly testing how the zebra could interact with humans and be helpful for an astronaut on its mission. Um, and then we also had the Igluna field campaign in Switzerland, which is organized by Space Innovation. And that was the first time that we tested our swarming. So we had multiple rovers for the first time carrying out a mission together on a mountain in Switzerland. We also had docking stations for the first time. So instead of having solar panels on the rovers, we had docking stations they could walk into and sit down and charge wirelessly. And when they were done, they would walk back out. And then this year, so far in 2022, we've been on the Minor 9 Plus mission with three of our rovers and there we um, once again, we're helping out and seeing how these rovers could be used in, in this case, in a mine. And it was detecting things like air ventilation, which is important for the safety of the miners, but also trying to see if vibrations would be detectable in the case of some kind of collapse to see if you could detect that with your rovers. So besides all these analog missions, we also of course continue with the development of our moon rover and that goes in a series of models. We've already made one engineering model so far and right now we're working on our second one, which is the first one to actually be space grade. So after this we'll likely have a qualification model and then a flight model leading us to a launch in hopefully a couple of years if all goes well. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation and if you would like to know more about Lunar Zebro, follow us on our website zebro.space on all the social media channels and we even have a podcast that you can find anywhere where there's podcasts. So thank you.